And now on uh, our evening segment of Phone Fest Live 2020, we go to Project FDL, who will be hosting us for the next uh, hour and a half uh, on design, engineering, and print in the 3D Nerf hobby. And we go now to the first segment uh, with him and with Jesse and Jackie uh, talking to uh, Alice Cookduck and H from H Attachments. Uh, and they will take you through until quarter past eight uh, for the first segment. So over to Jesse and Jackie in the studio. Hey guys, like Boff said, it's uh, Jesse and Jackie from Project FDL. Uh, if you guys don't know who we are, I would imagine most of you do, uh, but we are both of us, 50-50 uh, from Project FDL. Uh, I designed the FDL 1, 2, 3, um, and we're actually releasing a um, thing called the Pippin Pack pretty soon, which is sort of my take on a Proton Pack as well. Um, so again, like Boff said, we have Alice Kotzak with us here and H um, from H Attachments, which I thought was Atch. But... I'm glad that we have the people that that pronounce things correctly because it's H. Um, so we are going to talk um, with these two and then two more folks uh, in about 45 minutes about engineering, uh, technology, 3D printing, and things like that in the, the greater Nerf hobby. Um, so why don't we start by having the two of you guys kind of Give us your grand intro. Let us know who you are. Like, how long have you been in the hobby? What is it you do? That sort of stuff. Um, we can start with that. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, I've been in the hobby for, uh, I want to say, four years now, three or four years now. Um, uh, I do mostly design work now um, uh, and uh try to release open source parts and projects and, and stuff whenever I can. Cool. Hey, um, yeah, I'm in the UK and um, I've probably got my first Nerf Blaster like 10 years ago, but I'd probably say maybe the last four years is when I started getting into modding kind of more seriously. I've um, got my hands on a 3D printer, which kind of opened up a lot of doors for me. Um, I. Don't, I'm not really restricted to one kind of thing. Um, I mostly just like thinking, oh my goodness, could I make that kind of thing? And then I just try and do it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it fails. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just love um, the building process. I guess we can go too, right? So, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> <You're asking. laughs> I didn't the big intro for us. So I <clears throat> Project FDL has existed for I think about four years now. Four or five years, yeah. Um, I was designing stuff about a year prior with no common knowledge that the Nerf community actually existed. So I think I've been at this about about five years. Um, you kind of came on a little bit later. Yeah, like three years ago. Yeah. So I started what wasn't called Project FDL. It was just like FDL1 at the time. And then that got crazy enough that Jackie came, came on board. <laughs> so anyway, so I think, you know, we, we kind of chatted about stuff that we wanted to talk about ahead of time. Um, I know that the two of you guys kind of come from two sort of different backgrounds. Like H, I know you run like an Etsy shop, correct? Yeah, that's sort of where I started out. Um, I'm seeing if I can get over to something else, but, but yeah. That's why I have for now. Yeah. So you're selling mostly like pretty printed parts, um, designs that you've done that you're printing. Are you doing a lot of commissions or is it kind of stuff that you have pre-designed that you're selling? Um, I mostly started on like upgrade parts and small bits. So I'd normally print them myself. Um, but now I've got a bit more into blasters. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll take on an order or two um, for mm -hmm. some of the newest stuff I've designed. Um, yeah, I like keeping it slow because otherwise I get stressed if my printers break or something and the order takes really long to fulfill. So I sort of take one at a time. Yeah. So I know, Alice, you do a lot of commissions, correct? Like you don't necessarily have like a shop per se. You do, you yeah, um, I actually, I haven't taken commissions in uh, a little while now. It's mostly just been building for uh, myself and my friends if... Uh, you know, if, if that's the sort of thing I'm I'm feeling up to, um, uh, it really has mostly been design work and just printing off custom stuff. Um, 
but I haven't been been selling much of it now. Yeah. Um, cool. So that's sort of our backgrounds. What I I'm gonna ask the same question to both groups, um, and kind of go over like when you guys started the hobby, what was the tech like around? You know. Uh, what were people making things out of? What were they like? How is that different from what you are seeing now? And how does that make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Either one of you can go first. Uh, I'll, get in, I'll get it over with. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know if I was the most aware of everything in the hobby when I started, but I certainly remember like all the videos and things I was watching online was like uh, PVC pipes and cutting up shells, lots of epoxy putty, a lot, lot of kind of manual work. Um, people, people cutting things out of polycarb and whatnot. Um, and, and actually, I think at, yeah, at uni there was a guy that said basically, if you're not cutting it yourself out of polycarb and it's not modding, I don't like this 3D printing stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's too easy. Um, but no, I think I think that's kind of been the change. There's a a, a lot more um, CAD work I think coming into modding, and and it's opened up a load of awesome possibilities. Um, but sometimes I also like to just go back to like I'll get like my hacksaw out or something and feel like oh it's been a long time since I've used this. <laughs> so yeah. I'd say that's kind of the the change I've seen. What about you, Alice? Yeah, I was um, I was really surprised to find uh, how little advantage of 3D printing the community was taking. And actually, uh, the the people that I was really impressed with were actually uh, uh, you guys, Jackie and Jesse. Um, uh, and uh, I was also really surprised by the lack of brushless stuff, um, uh, which again is you guys. Um, uh, but yeah, like I remember a time when when what was considered the best homemade was, uh, you know, a couple of pieces of, of clear PVC with uh, some, you know, planks of wood with rounded corners glued on and screwed on. And, and you know, as time went by, people started to pick up 3D printing and using it for more and more stuff and, and now cosmetic stuff and not just, you know, arts mm -hmm. and, and that. it's getting really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think I experienced the same thing too. Except I think when I showed up to my first war, I already like had an actual <clears throat> one in hand. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did. You did. So, <laughs> you showed up, you were like, dunk, with yeah. this big thing in your hand. I didn't I didn't go through that experience of like, okay, here's my PVC thing, some polycarbonate and all of those things. I do. You did a couple homemades, but like, yeah. it was more like, oh, this war, I have to have this for, so I have to make this for that. Yeah. It wasn't, that was what your primary focus was doing. Yeah, but it was still, you know, it's the same experience as you guys. When I first got into it, there was there was a lot of PVC, and we had a pretty vibrant, you know, what you would call NIC scene in this in the southeast. Mm -hmm. So, like for people that don't that are new to the hobby, sometimes you hear NIC, and that means like the Nerf Internet community. Sometimes when people say that, it means. Uh, everybody has really powerful PVC blasters. <laughs> like there's kind of two different meanings there, but I did, I entered it into a scene that was pretty heavy into those. And that was, you know, the days like Nerfomania still exists. And his, his stuff was so cool and just handmade, you know, with saws and I don't know, it was really neat. But yeah, we've, we've definitely obviously <laughs> seen the, the, the 3D printing thing really grow and it's really amazing to watch so many people like learn CAD for yeah. the sake of designing a Nerf blast or like learn how to program for the sake of putting an Arduino in a Nerf blaster. I know Alice, when I first met you, you were like the one other person that I knew that was like putting an Arduino in a Nerf blast. And that was, that was pretty Thank cool you. at the time. Yeah, I, I got talked out of brushless um, by a, a bunch of people saying it was totally impractical. And I regret that. That's one of my biggest regrets was was not just, you know, putting my foot down and being like, no, we're going brushless now. Like, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah there was, 
it was awesome to, to meet somebody that that was on the same wavelength as me and you know. yeah i just i was just thinking about something now i don't know if you agree or not but i feel that perhaps what people have done more is move more where it's mostly modifying or a hasbro shell that you already had and people are now moving to thinking about completely making their own custom idea from scratch instead of just mm. tweaking something else and thinking about like what what did just what do they want in general and then starting to make that um with kind of the tools and things that we've discussed that have become more prevalent like in the recent years yeah well i mean look at the caliber with the yeah. caliber being open source everybody just took it and there's a new version of a caliber handle or grip or magwell or there i mean there's just so many different versions of it and it all comes from people just being able to take it and play with those files and tweak it to however they want yeah. it's, it's it's a really cool evolution to see yeah yeah the, the caliber was much more open source when it first came out i mean when i mm -hmm. got in and we had the fdl one and two it was more of here's the stl files you can go print it you know have fun with that or whatever i wasn't really cued into the, the official open source thing yet but i think yeah something like the caliber really started pushing people in that direction and made it really easy um so what i something that i wanted to get into with you guys as both as designers is what is your process like when you have a concept and you want to take that to like workable prototype. I'm not even talking like final products, because we all know that between working mm -hmm. prototype, prototype and final product is its own little game. But like, what is it like between concept and working prototype for you guys? Um, I, I'll, I'll go first, yes. Um, I, I think for me, I'm very focused on something practically working. Um, and I also try and make it look nice, but that's kind of on the secondary. So I think when I have an idea, I, I, kind of, I guess I think about the aspects of that idea. Um, so I guess I'll run through an example. So I made um, a auto raven kit, which is basically a copy of an auto strife kit. Um, and so just thinking about it, I think, okay, well, it's got to be really small and compact and fit in this space. Um, and I need to get some gears to mesh um, and they need to mesh correctly and not slip. Like you've got to get gears to be the right shape and all these things. So I'll kind of test each aspect of the design individually to kind of prove that it can work and then, and then make it slightly better, like a proof of concept essentially. Um, and then, and once you've got that working, then I'll work on the next part of the design and kind of get that working until I've then slowly got like a fully functioning thing that I can pop in a blaster, I guess. Cool. What about you, Alex? So um, when it comes to mechanical parts, I usually just sit there for, you know, several hours with a set of calipers and, you know, just sort of see what the design says to me and, and, and what it facilitates. But... Um, the thing that I have way more fun with is <clears throat> designing stuff from scratch. Um, so uh, if I'm designing a blaster from scratch, I will uh, start just, I'll start on a, 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 a sticky note. I've got a bunch of them on my wall and just like get the rough shape that is in my brain onto a sticky note and throw that up on the wall and, and just then probably ignore it for six months. Um, <laughs> uh, in that time, it will have, you know, stirred around in my brain and I uh, pull it up in Photoshop. Um, uh, and then I usually spend a couple hours uh, just trial and error drawing something um, that I think looks good. Um, and if it's something that has uh, really specific uh, mechanical requirements, um, I will 3D model the... Uh, the important bits, the, the technical bits, and then um, uh, export them with a little reference square so I know what size everything is. And then work on arranging those in a way that is functional and also um, aesthetically pleasing if, if I have that much room to, to mess around with it. Uh, and then I'll just, I'll just paint over that and just see what I like, what looks good, um, 
and then from there pull it into fusion and then do all the 3d modeling which i just said in one sentence but really is like a you know like four you know four day long process if i just did it start to finish yeah. so, so you kind of so when i do this um, I know that there are kind of two methodologies that people take. You either design inside out or outside in. Um, and I know somebody, so there was Jake Hengler. Uh, reciprocation a, props. Yes, reciprocation props. He is a local to us. He is like officially an industrial design engineer. Um, I don't consider myself officially an engineer. Like I do the engineering act, right? <laughs> but it's hard for me to officially say that. So he's an industrial engineer, and I, I know that like from that design perspective, you kind of design from outside in. So they do a lot of um, cutting things out of foam to get the, the like outside shape, and then you kind of figure out how to stuff stuff in later. I do very much the opposite of that. I do kind of what you were talking about, Alice, where you're like, all right, this is your basic, basic mechanical components. Let's figure out how big that needs to be kind of start designing around that, maybe come back to that a little bit later, work the way out. Like it's this kind of slinky thing. And um, I know it's an interesting process. I haven't really like landed on the right way to do that. I've been winging it the whole time. I'll be completely <laughs> honest with everybody. Um, I think I agree I with that kind, of, that kind of process. I'll normally have the main parts I have in the design. Um, so like I've been designing stuff for the Supercore recently, um, which is a HBA kind of system. And so I'll have that with its fittings leading to a, um, a valve because I, I know that has to be take up that much space. And then I'll have like a handle floating somewhere in CAD just as like a reference. Um, mm -hmm. and as I go through the process, I kind of, oh, I might move that over and then add, like, add in some flywheels from somewhere else and reference that and move it around. Um, that's something that I, I think is amazing about Fusion is that you can bring in separate objects and files into one space and move them around just to reference. And it, it makes everything so much easier, I think. Yeah. I'm so new to Fusion. Like, I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> it's, so I came from AutoCAD, right? Which is, uh, like, I did a lot of architecture, not architectural, but, like, building level stuff in AutoCAD. And that, that's a very different process. And I tried to apply that to 3D modeling. And it's real hard because the things are static, right? So there's no like, I draw a cylinder now. Um, you know, I'm going to go back 10 million design steps from now and say, well, I want that circle to actually be this size, right? You're, you're, you're basically taking a piece of clay, sculpting it as you go. So I made a lot of my design process starts a lot with me sitting and staring at the screen and doing absolutely nothing. Can and like, confirm. Yeah. <laughs> like kind of talking about like right what you do, H, where you're like, eh, yeah, let's get everything kind of in a space. But then it's just hours of just staring at it, trying to like figure out how everything's yeah. going to go together. <laughs> at the beginning, there's like a hundred different ways that you could attach this part to that part or make it something bend around. And it's like, well, I don't want to commit to like something that's wrong or, or not the most efficient. So mm -hmm. yeah, you just spent so long just trying to think about it. Yeah. That's a huge part of why I like, uh, you know, like getting all my parts straight and then just painting over everything in, in Photoshop because then I can get a really solid picture of what I want it to look like in the end without having to actually like commit to 3D modeling the whole thing. But then also knowing that everything's going to fit. How good at drawing are you guys? I'm terrible. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty bad. <laughs> He's so. bad too. <laughs> I, I, I mean, from my, from my understanding, Alice, like, you seem like really artistic and you're always designing stuff that looks like really great. <laughs> so, I can't believe you're not that good at drawing. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, the, the truth is um, I, I can get to a design that I like, but it's usually over a very long process of... I drew this line and it looks terrible. So I erased it and drew it again and again and again. And finally I see something that I like and I'm like, okay, that's good. Just don't touch it ever again. Cause I'll never be able to replicate that. Um, yeah. I think so that um, when I'm drawing something for me to try and figure a design out, um, I, like I've been doing that a bit since, since school and DT and through my engineering degree. So I, I have a, 
an all right ability to draw, I guess. Um, but you don't really have to put that much effort in as long as you understand it. It's when you've got to start conveying an idea to someone else and you have to take it to be really slow and get all the lines right and everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think drawing a concept is easy as long as nobody else sees it. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> it's an organized mess. You understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, do you guys have anything that you are kind of working on currently that you want to talk about or anything? Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got a few things. Um, I've got I've got one thing that I got together the other day, um, which would be kind of fun to show. Um, I've got into HPA blasters a lot, and so I like thinking about what is something new that we haven't done yet. And so I've adapted the Supercore to be able to shoot three round shells in um, a blaster like this. I actually have to give props to um, Pete from Firm Alliance UK has kind of designed the blaster. Um, then he let me modify it um, to take uh, what I was looking at. Um, I'll just turn on my air and I've got a mag loaded. And again, talking about the design process, this is like the first one I've printed. And so not everything is quite right. I'm literally just trying to prove the concept of if I can use the Supercore to load a shell and then also eject it. Um, and so when I put this in and I let go, this will come forwards and then eject. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Shell ejecting yeah. HPA, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, the, I was trying to just make something really simple. So there's basically a lever arm. So when when the supercore head is back, the, the, it hits the arm and makes it push out to eject. And when it comes forwards, um, it can then freely float the other way and just get out of the way. Um, so yeah, it's not perfect. Sometimes the shells kind of hit and then slide a bit sideways, which you don't want, you want it to be centered. And so like, that's something I'm going to have to figure out, a design feature or maybe a spring-loaded flap or, or something to fix that. Um, but again, like, that's just all part of building something and iteratively making it better when you come across problems. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. So, uh, oh. yeah, have you got something, Alice? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh you know, Atch is over here with a full printed prototype and I've just got something that I was, uh, so uh, a while ago on a live stream, I started designing uh, in Photoshop a, a blaster that I had an idea for. Um, just as like a, hey, like let's, I'm gonna take you through my design process and just like show you how I, I get to a, a piece of concept art. And um, uh, then they bullied me and now I made it. Uh, so, um, it's in the, pr it's, it's sort of in the process of, of being done. And I did that. I, I started it the other day, um, just sort of, so I would have something, uh, to show this exact thing. Cause you guys mentioned that, um, that was what we were going to be doing. So, uh, I'm going to turn on my screen share and, uh, hopefully that, that works out. Okay. Um, so I've got. Fusion pulled up here. Oh, Sorry, there's, not a whole that's lot of, good. there's not a whole lot of contrast, so it's a little bit hard to see, but um, this is my, my piece of concept here. Uh, and uh, uh, from that, I have then taken it and I don't have the stock done and there's there's some clear issues with the, the grip. Um, one of the biggest issues I encounter is uh, taking a a project from uh, the second dimension where it's really easy to, you know, have conflicts in, in like heights and, and distances and, and stuff like that and, and bringing it into the third dimension. And, and what I mean there is I expected this grip to be thicker than the magazine and that's not at all the case. <laughs> I'm going to have to redesign this section here, but, but this sort of gives uh, a decent understanding of, of, I guess, what I'm going for. Um, and I, I hope this, sort of visually explains, you know, some of my process going from, uh, going from just the, uh, the, the piece of art over to, you know, something functional. And then, um, 
uh, further along in the process, we're going to jump to a different thing here. But um, you know, uh, once I've got the shape blocked out and everything, I uh, will uh, shell it out and give some support structures on the inside. And uh, basically, uh, once everyone thinks it's done, it's actually you know another couple weeks of work to get it to a, a decent point. And then uh, if we go from there, um, uh, here's Ooh, my first nice. prototype for it. Um, so Good. I've shown this off at a, at a couple different events. Uh, and it's not functional, um, which is why I'm still working on it in CAD. Um, mm. But we're getting there. And uh, yeah. That's awesome. How many pieces is that? Like how many prints? Uh, this is six prints, but in reality, it was more like 12 because my nozzle kept clogging. So <laughs> this is, uh, this is like, I think six days of solid printing across like three machines. So oh is it, yeah, this is a dumb question. It's a Springer. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. basically just a plus bow. I just wanted to make it look nice. So nice. Solid. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, I've got some ideas that aren't finished, but they're kind of uh, more of, a, I guess, an engineering functional kind of project, um, which kind of shows that process. Um, a while ago, I was trying to think about a high capacity uh, magazine. And so tried to design a snail type mag for half darts. You and um, <laughs> if you say, this, this would hold 35 darts if it worked. Um, but it didn't work. <laughs> but yeah, I had to go through like a few processes. So for instance, the follower has to come be able to like rotate all the way around. And so was it? Yeah, it, it kind of imitates three darts um, with a pivot. Um, and then the main problem though was that there was just too much friction. So it, it could push mm -hmm. darts up from about that point. Um, but as soon as they went around here, uh, the spring just wasn't strong enough. And I even used two drum springs. Um, it wasn't happening. And so then I thought, well, maybe I'll add some, some ridges on the wall here so that the darts aren't sliding against the whole wall, but just two ridges, maybe reduce the friction, um, spread a whole load of like lubrication in there. Um, and then that still didn't work. <laughs> so currently it's, I'm not saying this can't happen, but line one doesn't currently work. So I'm working on other things, but yeah, the whole challenge was thinking like, okay, physically, or I guess the physics or whatnot, what's, why is it not working? And then you have to try and put your mind to how you might fix that with some, some physical design features. And then Sometimes you have to just bail on stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. would love to. Oh, are that you way. saying that you should? No, no, no. I'm not, okay. Sorry. That came out wrong. <laughs> I didn't mean that bail on stuff. I'm saying like everybody at some point like has a grand idea and sometimes it doesn't work out. Yeah, so that's yeah. that's the hard thing as an engineer too is like, cool, I really want to make this thing work and I'm gonna just try to make it work a million times and sometimes but anyway, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Um I just have one other one. Um I printed a picture because I don't have it with me with the current lockdown and all that. Um but I, I was trying to basically think of a different way of doing a high capacity magazine. And so this is a pusher in a strife, basically. And I thought if you use half length darts and stack them double stack in a mag, but like one behind the other. Um, so you have two stacks coming up. Um, that's a way in which you could hold way more darts, but then you need a pusher that can push those through. And so I kind of looked at the, the hybrid pusher that uh, Milan uh, developed and thought that um, what you can do is copy what a Chaos Mike does with his rival balls and push the rear stack into the other stack and you just keep pushing through. Um, but that that design doesn't, the, the flexible pusher, the hybrid one, doesn't work very well when uh, you were trying to push darts both in a rear stack and a front stack. It works great at one or the other. Um, mm -hmm. And so thinking thinking about that, I thought, what do I need? I need it to be able to be really strong when it's pushing in this direction, but also with really tiny force, be able to be 
flipped up when the force comes from this direction. And so with those kind of two categories, that then made me think about, okay, what kind of shape can do that? And so this is a triangular piece that actually is on a, a little pivot with a very weak spring at the top there. So this thing can this thing can pivot up with like such a tiny force. But if you push it from this side, it's on a bit of an angle. So it's it's never gonna rotate upwards if it's pushed, it's just gonna stay in place. I don't know if that's clear or not. But yeah, with, with, with that design done, I didn't actually have enough throw um, or travel for the pusher. So then I also had to redesign all of this stuff so that I could get the maximum amount of um, throw in, in this small confined space. Um, that, one, that one does work. Um, it's just, I haven't, I don't know, I've kind, of, I've kind of left it for a bit. So I might, I might get back to that at some point, but you've got to pick your projects to work on. Yeah. Nice. I, Go ahead. Uh, I for one am, am really glad that, that Atch uh, did the, the snail mag and found out that it didn't work before I did it because I had a similar idea and now I cannot do it. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, just need to, you just need to change it somehow or, or do something slightly different because we need to make a snail mag that works. Yeah. What right. if you put a bunch of rollers around the outside? I've actually had yeah. lots of thoughts about this. Of like, how do you do a proper drum mag not something that I'd ever actually want to sit down and put pen to paper, but like if you had some sort of like <clears throat> like thing where you had a bunch of roll, and you could even print these. I'm not talking about like hundred bearings along this thing, right? But, <laughs> well, but I, I can see I that. I actually over. have that idea. That was the next thing. Because um, uh, my, my 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 friend designed the um, that kind of P90 style blaster, the bulwark that came out recently. Yeah. And that has to go through 90 degrees. And he uses some printed, just some printed bosses with little loops on them. And they just act as bearings. Um, and so I printed a design like that. But they, they had to be so tiny, small, the posts. And they were really long. that most of them just sort of snapped off. Um, and so it, it was a bit of a failure. But it, I mean, I tried. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else do I have? Um, I'm trying to make an HPA grenade launcher. Um, <laughs> nice. Process of, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in the process of um, building that. I'm running out of filament though, and um, it's kind of low with the whole lockdown and everything. Yeah, it's really hard to get right now. I mean, this is the, I printed out a picture. This is what it should look like eventually. <laughs> I love his pictures. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know a screen share was gonna work. Um, you should have the ability to have a bottle on or have a remote a remote line, um, and so that should yeah that should take shells which shoot actual rockets. Um, that a guy in New Zealand I think has designed, because um, there was a, uh, an earlier Struno talking about shield busting and saying that no one really uses demolisher rockets even though they can destroy shields because there's just nothing that can really shoot them very well. So I was like, oh, we we need a solution to that. I'll, I'll try and make something that can shoot demolish rockets. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've got a few parts together. Um, it's difficult because the trigger pull has to do three different actions. And so there's a, like a gear in here and things moving in different directions. But um, yeah, luckily you guys don't have to sort that out. I, I go through all the, the struggle and pain and then I'll release that and everyone else can just <laughs> get a product. <laughs> it's cool to see you digging into HPA. I have a super core here too that I'm gonna do something. I want to do some something point. with. I just don't know what and when. Well, I mean, if you want to put it in a ballpark, you could do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not I, I, I need one. I need one of those <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I get more materials in, I can I can start making more. But yeah, it's just crazy. I know. Um, have we got any questions in the chat at all? Yeah, it looks like we've got uh, a couple here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll ask this one. Uh, what was the process of designing the FDL? Did you start uh, from the bottom or the front or whatever? Which one? The, probably the first <laughs> one, right? Uh, the well, because there were so, different design processes for It each. says FDL 3. Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, so. so the FDL, I mean, they've all compounded on each other, right? The, the 
most of the design was done on the one. Like that's when I really figured out how how do you actually fling a, a cylinder of foam from two spinning things? Like that's really actually hard to do. Like when you're starting from scratch, it's really actually hard to get the well, dart and, to shoot. and not and knowing took, nerve. <laughs> yeah, but um, I mean, it was it was what we were what we kind of touched on before. It was like, what are the basic mechanisms that need to happen here? Like, I know the flywheels have to happen, right? So design like some sort of cage, and to the original FDL one. Two minutes left of the current year. Sorry, <laughs> we we were being talked to. Um. <laughs> The original cage, the original FDL one was actually brushed motors. It was those like big honking 380 motors. I was like, wow, yeah, if you just put giant motors on this, it'll hurl a mega dart really fast, and it did. Um, but then the next step was, cool, we got a dart firing through this cage. Uh, how do you push, you know, the dart into that? And then it was like, let's Google different simple mechanisms and like, you know, oh cool, scotch yoke, that's the easiest to, to turn like a circular motion into a linear motion. Let's go with that and then it's get those on screen and figure out how big that needs to be. And then like, where do the darts sit? You know, and there still to this day isn't like a super accessible mega dart mag. Um, so the choice was made to do a revolver at that time. It, the FTL one was very much like, let's do all of the things that are really hard to do and just do them, you know? Um, but then- that's, that's brilliant though, because that's how you learn all the all the little things that you need to do. Like when you come now to designing a new blaster, you're not, even though you're starting from scratch, yeah. you're not really starting from scratch. You already kind of have this wisdom on how do I make a flywheel cage and what, what are good motions for something to rotate or how thick does this part need to be if it's probably not going to break yeah. and those kind of things you, you pick up along the way and kind of make the design process a bit easier i think yeah yeah i have kind of a library that i can work off of now we do have to stop yeah we got time is up, up. <laughs> i'm gonna yeah. say thank you to you guys um it's been an awesome chat uh if you have anything you want to talk about where can we follow you guys like where can we you know, so you're find working. the stuff that you're working on and stuff like that. Um, well, um, I probably post most of my stuff on uh, my Facebook page, which is uh, Atch Attachments. So you'll probably find that there. Um, yeah, I don't do Instagram or anything else, really. It's probably just, just Facebook. Um, I do Instagram, but I hate it. Um, uh, but <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly on YouTube, um, but I'm Alice Coat Duck everywhere, so... <laughs> Awesome. And we're Project FDL, at Project FDL. Yeah. All of your favorite Just search platforms. for Project FDL on whatever platform you're on. And if it comes up, it comes up. It doesn't. <laughs> but yeah. Thank awesome. you, guys. This was really fun. No, it was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Spectre N7. Join me and a host of other nerfers for Foam Fest Live on Twitch. Saturday, April 18th from 12 noon BST. Talks, live streams, and loot. Search Foam Fest Nerf on Facebook for more info. again uh, on Foam Fest Live 2020 we are back with Project FDL uh, for our design engineering and print segment this time we join Milan from Devil Z Nerfworks and Niklas from nerfkrieg.dk 
uh, who will be talking uh, some interesting stuff about Fusion and various other uh, software for 3D design in the nerfing hobby. So over to Jesse in his studio. Hey guys, it's uh, it's Jesse from Project FPL again. <laughs> uh, if you were here for the last segment, uh, we're going to do something pretty similar this time around. Um, so like Bob said, we have uh, Milan from Devil Z Nerfworks and Nicholas from uh, Nerf EK. Um, and so we are here to talk about basic design, engineering, 3D printing, things like that um, in the Nerf community and the Nerf hobby. Um, so what I want to do is have you guys start and kind of each of you go through, like, how did you get into the hobby? Um, what was it like kind of when you got into the hobby? Or no, 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 let's start with just basic intro. So like, who, who are you guys? What do you do? What are you known for? Do you have Etsy shops, blah, things like that? Milan, you can go first. Okay. Uh, hi, first of all, um, if you could get me on stream. Nice. Okay. Hi, first of all, I'm Milan. I'm also known in the hobby as Devil's Nerf or Devil's Nerf Works. Um, I've been part of the hobby for a good five years probably now, six maybe. Um, and I run a small Etsy shop, um, again, under Devil's Nerf. Yeah. Um, I do 3D printed parts, um, the usual. But I, I think I have some. Some pretty unique designs and ideas uh, out there. Uh, yeah, I got started in the hobby uh, when I got a small job with Blaster Parts. Um, at that time, uh, the German community was uh, very, very uh, secluded from, from the international or American community. Um, so I got a job with Blaster Parts and 3D printing was was just uh, getting making its way into the hobby, especially here in Germany. Uh, Blaster Parts had a few parts from Slidev in their shop, I believe, and I think they still have some of them. Most of them I redesigned uh, while I did an internship there, uh, just because they only had STL files and no CAD models. Um, and yeah, now I've been at uh, Foamfest. Um, my first big international Nerf event last year, two years, no, not last year, two years ago. Man, what, the time flies. Um, yeah. It's it's sad this year. This year isn't going to happen, but maybe maybe there will be another event I can uh, participate yeah. in return. And yeah, I, I found my way into the international community uh, just fine. Feel super welcome, and I'm glad to be here now. Awesome, uh, awesome to have you. What about you, Nicholas? Yes, uh, my name is Nicholas, also known as NerfCreep.dk. I'm a part of the Danish com Nerf community, and basically also part of the UK Nerf community since I travel to half of their games by now. I run a small Etsy shop where I sell very small bits and pieces for modding, and I do custom blasters. I've been nerfing for like, seriously for about three years, but only really getting into CAD modeling in the last half year or so. Awesome. Cool. Well, it's awesome to have you guys. Um, so I asked the last group, and I want to ask you guys too. And Milan, you started going down this path a little bit, but like when you guys got into the hobby, what was the tech around you like? I know, like, so I've been in the hobby about four or five years now. I still, you know, I was kind of designing the stuff that I was designing prior to actually starting to attend wars and stuff. So my first war, I showed up and I had this, like, fully 3D printed thing. It was, like, a, a little bit different than I think most people's experiences. But at the time, it was very much still, like, if people had PVC stuff. There was a lot of polycarb being cut and, like, you know, hand filed and stuff. Um, and now we are in this sort of, you know, the age of the 3D printer or whatever. Um, how have you guys, like, what was your, the tech around you liked when you got into it? And what do you feel like it's like now? And do you, like, are you happy with that? Sad about it? How do you feel like that affects things in general? 
Okay, I'll try to talk first about uh, what I experienced uh, with the community here in Germany when I got started with Blaster Parts, um, and then get back to the tech now. Um, when I got into Blaster Parts, I, I touched on that uh, just before. They had they had just a few parts um, in their web shop uh, that they got from Slidev in Australia. Um, I think the first cosmetic mod kits were popping up. Uh, I'm pretty sure I, I did a basically a German uh, or blaster parts version of the uh, Chris Vector kit that was only 3D printed back then. Um, it never made it to, to the shop because it's just too much printing for, for uh, such a small company. But um, yeah, that, that was, that was kind of it. Um, I, I, during that time, I designed uh, a top rail for the long shot, and I think there was only one other around. Um, other than that, um, mostly mostly aesthetic accessories. Um, some yeah, some small vendors, but, but very limited. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, now we have so many, huh? <laughs> It's yeah, like yeah, now eight million little Etsy shops. Is, everybody is a vendor, um, mm -hmm. which I don't know. It has probably has its downsides, but it's also also a great thing to see and make mm -hmm. uh, come to life. What about yeah, you, Nicholas? Please. Like, what what was the state of things kind of when you got into it? Uh, back when I got into NERF in like 2016 or 2017, around there, we had just had the release of the original uh, Rhino motors and the, the what they call Hellcat motors, where I built a strife with just the Hellcats and the worker wheel and then an artifact red cage, which was basically the highest end strife you could get back then. And it worked great for the wall I built here and the community we started. But now with the expansion of yeah, 3D printing and then now brushless, brushless technology from, especially from you guys and then the ultrasonic blasters and Toro Mark II, there's been a huge increase in the possibilities of what we can actually do here while nerfing and what we'll do to our blasters. That's cool. And not only brushless, I remember printed cages not being around. Um, when I started at Blaster Parts. There was Dr. Snickers mm -hmm. in Germany doing his machine cages. And I know Blaster Parts tried to get him to, to design like a commercial version for them that they could sell. Uh, but he never agreed for him. It wasn't, wasn't about mm -hmm. the money. It was uh, only about doing his, his thing. Yeah. Maybe he, he was cages so, for, for himself and, and for a few friends, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I think this the Snickers cages were sort of just starting to come out around the time that I got into things. And yeah, that was my interpretation of what was going on at the time. It was like Snickers is this super high end engineer and like I yeah. doubt you'd ever see anything super sellable from him. But then yeah, we kind of went through the, there was Snickers and then, you know, Worker started coming out with their, their like artifact cages and stuff. And then you saw Open Flywheel Project. And then and I designed a cage for blaster parts. I designed a cage for blaster parts and even printed some prototypes, but it never occurred to us that we could just sell printed cages. We yeah. never thought they'd, they'd be viable. People would think, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Now they're a dime a dime, like they're everywhere. It's so, it's so cool to see. Um, and especially with the pos new possibilities you get from them with adding dart guides or different levels of crush, which has hugely increased, again, the possibilities of what we can do now, all the way down for almost stock performance up to the high crush stuff where you can hit 150 or 60 with a standard setup now, and even more with the specialized setups. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more flywheels now too. Like that's the like you can get a lot of like a 3D printed cage, but what flywheels do you put in it too? And there's such a plethora of different like machined wheels now too. Um, okay, so what I wanted to get into you, with 
you guys is um, we all are kind of entering or have different experience levels with uh, Fusion 360. Fusion 360 being kind of like a very prominent CAD software that's used sort of within the hobby. Um, I personally come from an AutoCAD background, which is a like direct modeling. It's basically like you're just forming clay together and the decisions that you make are there forever. Um, I have, as of a couple of my past or like recent designs, sort of gotten into Fusion 360. So I had I came into Fusion 360 with a lot of CAD experience, um, but I'm having to unlearn a lot of things. Um, I know, Milan, you have a lot of Fusion 360 experience and you're real into like the freeform sort of stuff. Uh, and then Nicholas, it sounds like you're maybe a little newer to it in general. Um, yeah, yeah, I've been using like Fusion for about half a year. Had a bit of previous experience from SolidWorks, which I used at school, but nothing has influenced how I'm able to learn Fusion now. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it'll be, we have three sort of different levels of experience with this thing. It'll be cool to kind of talk through. Um, so like I said, I, I came from direct modeling. So <clears throat> direct modeling, like I said, is sort of like you put a cylinder on the screen, right? And that cylinder has the size that it is at the time. And if you want to put a hole in it, uh, then you put another cylinder and you cut it out of that one. And then the size of those things is what it is at the time. And if you need to make it bigger or smaller, you have to kind of add like more pieces of clay to it. Um, Fusion 360 is what's called parametric right Milan do you want to explain yes. kind of what parametric is versus yeah sure direct? Um, so the basic part of, of parametric modeling is that you that you uh, capture your design history and that's what it's also called in fusion it's an option that you can turn off and off um, parametric modeling means uh, you start with a sketch everything you do you start with a sketch um, and then you you do an operation with that sketch. You can do a sketch a circle, and you can extrude a cylinder from that circle. That cylinder will always be dependent on the sketch. So uh, when you change the dimension of your circle, your cylinder changes as well. Um, now then you can can add chamfers and holes and other features to that cylinder, and they will always be dependent on the cylinder and on the sketch. So if you change, if you added a chamfer and some holes to the cylinder um, and change the sketch, the size of the cylinder changes. Uh, your chamfers, um, of course, a change with the cylinder, um, depending on the relations you put in place. Uh, what that allows you to do is a structure your whole map model that you can set specific sizes at the beginning. And change them when you when you uh, notice that some of them aren't quite right. I could model pistol or something a blaster from my head mostly and make up dimensions um, that are roughly in the in the right ballpark, and then I can change those dimensions later to the exact ones that I need. Yep, I think that's a really important part of it right there. And that's like when I started getting into parametric modeling, that's the big difference is you are just kind of roughing in what you're doing and then you can come in and really tweak it afterwards. And that's the the power of that. Exactly. Um, Direct Nicholas, modeling has its advantages, sorry. Like yeah. Modeling has, has its advantages, it's, it's super fast. Um, and if you if you know how to get where you want, it's, it's super easy. And, you just can just bang out a part and there it is. Yeah. Um, especially for more complex parts, uh, parametric modeling just gives you a lot of security. Mm -hmm. um, can always yeah, this, go back and change things. That's taken me a lot of getting used to is like the speed at which I could get things designed with AutoCAD is very quick. Whereas with Fusion, like, it takes longer to get there, but if I need to make tweaks later, it happens much quicker too. So I kind of, I think it evens out. Um, Nicholas, I'm curious from your standpoint, what what is it like learning 
Fusion 360? Like, is it easy? Is it hard? Did you grasp it quickly, or what's that like? I found the learning curve to just get into a tools and basic modeling to be pretty easy. But at this point, and at the project I'll be showing off later, I've basically just been creating the sketches and then extruding them. And I can see I have a million different possibilities on my toolbar, but I don't know how to use them yet. So the skill ceiling of it is incredibly high, and it's a super powerful program if you know what you're doing. And I currently don't really. Yeah, you pick up little bits at a time. <laughs> yeah, th that was big half of the reason why I started this project was I needed something to keep the motivation going to actually sit down and learn this program. And now I, after, well, developing since end of November, I almost have a finished master. I, ha I had planned to be ready for phone test here, but it's all the way there yet. Nice. Um, guess, so, to you, Milan, like um, what you did, you did a, a stream during the world's largest mod party thing. Um, and uh, you talked about freeform modeling. And I know you're real into like doing very stylistic things and stuff. How do you go from, I have a concept and a bunch of roughed in sort of blocks. Uh, I need to make that functional. And then I need to make it look good. Like how do you, how do you do that? What's your sort of process for it? Um, okay, I'll try to go over the process first, and then I'll touch on some of the, the um, stylistic uh, ways, you, uh, some of the ways you can, you can add design to your parts. Uh, I always like to start out with a sketch. Um, of course, just for your to get your ideas straight. Um, to, to put the parts together in your mind and and find if they actually fit together like they should. Um, so you can start out with a sketch. Um, I actually recently uh, got, a, got a laptop on which I can draw with a pencil. Uh, that's super handy to just have the drawing directly on my on my machine and uh, import it into CAD later. So um, you start out with a sketch, rough sketch, um, dynamic sketch, perspective whatever you can do and want to do. It doesn't have to be a lot, but uh, you can go in as deep as you want. Um, and then you can uh, try to figure out uh, a sideways view or even a sideways view, a front view, a top-down view um, that you can import into your CAD program. Uh, Fusion has the option, and every, every CAD program has some way of doing it. Fusion has the option to add in a canvas that is just any picture or a drawing. Uh, add in a canvas, and then you can just sketch on top of that. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when it comes to design, uh, you want to have the design communicate the function of your of your part. So that's that's why most Nerf blasters look sort of like guns, um, even if we want to distance ourselves from from uh, firearms. Um, there there is a design language in there. We have we have handles, we have triggers, we have barrels, uh, which our projectiles come out of. <sighs> Let me catch a breath here. <laughs> I've so, been doing most of the same ways to start a project. I've started with some sketches. I have the first one here mm -hmm. with the solenoid, a magazine, a couple yeah. of master boards, and then a set of wheels, which is dated to the 28th of November last year, which was the first sketch for this project. And then that's a very functional sketch. Yes. So I, I'm not so, artistic, so. Yeah, and moved on yeah. to this one, which added a bit of the more triggers and a bit of the handle in the first place. And that's basically all I've sketched. And then I just started designing stuff for it and end up with something that now looks like uh, this. Come on, Discord. But that's actually pretty good. Um, you can start directly with your functional sketch. Um, 
and then build your design around it, or you can start with your design and then figure out uh, how to put the components inside. And yeah. I think you, I believe you talked about that in the last segment as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, what I learned in my in my uh, studies, I'm I'm studying uh, to be an industrial designer, uh, is that you should always put um, have the design of your thing, of your product, of your Blaster uh, communicate its function. Um, and everything that goes beyond that is styling. And you want to reduce uh, styling. So for example, if I if I design um, a block with a grip and, and uh, all this front for, for the flywheels, and then put some some arrows on it uh, and, and maybe a camel pattern, that's styling. And you can do that to a certain degree, but it always has to to connect with the design in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've not gotten to the styling part of this project yet. <laughs> still, still just working for the functional. I'm planning for it to be a very functional build with just the talons, a daybreak gauge, and then a solenoid with the battery in the stock. There is, I'm throwing a lot of inspiration, but from the grid because I really love that blaster and it's super simple and super clean. So that was my starting point that I wanted to play with solenoids and it is just turned into this now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, we talked about that with the last group, like you said, Milan, if like working inside out or outside in. Um, and I'm curious. So you say you want your design to communicate the function. Right. So does does that mean you have your functional pieces like Nicholas is showing something that is bare, you know, kind of bare bones, right? He has a very small he has a is the solenoid, the cage, the magwell, the handle, like the very bare essentials. Like, would you say that that is where you start? Like you have your basic components and then you style out from there or is it kind of you have a shape that you want and you kind of figure out how to work that into your shape? Because I know you can kind of go both directions. It's it's really nothing that I would um, say only do it strictly one way or the other. There are very valid reasons for, for both. Um, but what I take out of uh, Nicholas' designs, what is, uh, for example, good and, and what is doing its purpose of, of communicating it's, the function is that he has uh, very straight lines that go towards the front of the blaster, for example, um, that basically tell you, oh, that's that's where, where your dart goes. And then the grip is, is not follow, following those lines. So you don't, your eyes don't get drawn down your grip or, or wherever. Um, for what, for example, is, is not as good right now is that you have the front with the flywheels and your blaster shape just ends in, in that cage and, and it stops. So that would be would be the design not following the function. Yeah, I, I'm um, still planning to put some sort of front attachment on there. Right now it's just the bare yeah. minimum to keep it functional, sure. but <laughs> still still working on it. Yeah, I'm not trying to tear your design apart here. Um, you know, it's just uh, a process. But, it? Yeah, of course, that doesn't mean mean uh, you shouldn't do it any other way. Um, Alice Kotak, for example, has some very curvy blaster designs, but they still have uh, some some dynamic lines that go towards the front of the blaster, and they don't just drift off. That's, I think there's that's... a lot of things that you can get into that are very subconscious too. Like one of the things that I adhere to, like on the FDL3, is there are like three basic angles. So like if you look at the front, I don't have one right here. If you look at the front, there's the two angles. Those are 25 degrees, right? And then the handle is also a 25 degree tilt. And then any of the other lines on it all follow that same angle. So it's a very like pleasing, uh, you know, uniform sort of thing. Um, and that, 
think makes a big difference. Like when you have a piece of a design that you're kind of carrying through, you uniformly use something that's interesting. Yeah, you're definitely on the, on the right track with that one. Um, but of course, it doesn't have to be the exact same angles. Right. Um, the result you're getting is, is a little chunky, blocky blaster, and that's that's a very that's an aesthetic that you had for the FDL before, and that's one that you continued and refined uh, for the FDL three. So it, it kind of communicates your brand as well. Um, but of course, you can have those lines um, a reference to a point. You can have lines converging uh, on a point and not be exactly parallel. Uh, that that way you can get a lot of, uh, more uh, dynamic uh, lines in your blaster. And I think that's also um, one of the pitfalls that uh, a lot of a lot of uh, beginner uh, 3D modelers fall into is just make everything parallel and uh, line up in that fusion design grid. Yeah, I, I've done that a lot here where every uh, every take the an increase of half a millimeter in order to just make it easier for the first project with no weird angles or curves or anything like that. But that that's something I'll definitely want to learn in order to either make this look a bit more prettier to incorporate in the next design, whatever that may be. Yep. I mean, you've got a lot of room to do a lot of things there too. I yeah, see a lot of people do this too. They get to this point with a blaster where they're like, wow, this looks really cool. Or like, I have achieved the function that I want, right? But it is kind of blocky or whatever at the time. And then it's figuring out what do I do from there? <clears throat> how do I how do I make it look more pleasing? Like the term, you know, greebles comes up and it, what do I put on here that is maybe not necessarily totally functional and things like that. Um, how so I guess my question back to you, Milan, is do you have that kind of functional thing? And like in Nicholas's respect, like where would you start if and I don't want to use that specifically as an example, <laughs> but it's interesting to have have a blaster at that point and you want to add styling to there. Like how do you what's your process there? Like do you or adding things onto it? Do you start just rounding things out? Like, what does that look like? Um, so with, with something like uh, Nicholas Design here or something like a Griffin, for example, um, the, the most practical way is, is to take the, the base of your blaster, make it functional, um, make it as minimal as possible, and then add the options, uh, add, add mounting options for for everything, for uh, bigger uh, top half shell parts, front ends, um, and that's. And so, if I have the base, I could just uh, do a render, uh, import it into my drawing program, or just print it out and draw on that, uh, and then try to come up with something something more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I'm not a good artist, <laughs> and we we talked about this in the last the last thing too. When we both we all figured out that like we're all really mediocre artists, but we can design things pretty good. And it's uh, that's an interesting thing. Like it's interesting to hear you say like I'm gonna take this out and pull it into a drawing pro you know program and freehand things over the top of it, and that's sort of the next step past I think what a lot of us do and it's it's cool to hear um yeah so we are at five minutes out it looks like Milan you want to share some stuff um yeah I wanted I wanted to hit back on the points I just mentioned um by showing off this um this is a uh, stock I designed it's uh, designed to hold a battery and you can see the angles by um at all parallel to each other. I have this main uh, section that takes the buffer tube, of course. I have a cutout here, and then I have uh, my battery box that is uh, angled 
towards the bottom, but uh, picks up perpendicular, somewhat perpendicular, it's not perfectly perpendicular, to the butt plate. Um, and in CAD, I would have never come up with a shape like this, um, but in drawing, I can. So this is the sketch that I put underneath. This is the sketch that I started out with. I did a rough shape, uh, and then I sketched again over, over my original sketch to define the lines a little and uh, figure out the shape that I want my final uh, CAD model to, to be in. And uh, if you then do sketches, you'll see you have to change a lot of the lines to make it right, but the, the uh, original concept is still there. That's cool. Um, see any of the stuff I did. Uh, just a nice travel. So we did have. Did you see me turn on the canvas here, or? Yeah, it sounded like there was maybe some some trouble seeing your screen. So we have two minutes left. Um, and we have in our chat been told that. Uh, the raffle is now at 2,500 pounds. It's really awesome. Thank you to all of you guys. Um, oh, 2,565 where we're at. Um, so we have, so you guys looked at the, the schedule. Uh, Captain Slug was on, you know, the docket for our group. Uh, but he wasn't with us in person. Um, and I believe that we have a video uh, to show of his. Um, before we get into that, um, I want to thank you guys for being here. Uh, I know I feel like we all would love to try to chat about this for a long, long time. Um, Uh, we would want to chat about this for a long time. I wish we had longer. Um, can you guys let us know like where we can find you? Um, are you on social media? Like where's the best place for people to see the stuff that you're working on? What's that look like? I don't know if Milan's having trouble or what's going on there. Why don't you talk it, about it? It looks it? like <laughs> his camera is loading. Not sure if it's here, but yeah. you can find me. On, I'm mostly posting on Instagram and Facebook as nerfcreep.dk. If, like I've been messaging in the chat before, and there'll definitely come some more updates and probably a bit more info in the next segment I'm in with the UK Nerf War. Mm -hmm. What is the project called that you're working on right now? Uh, this is Project Swan currently. Sweet. As I saw all the bird theme small pistols, and I thought I want to do something like that. And the Swan is the national bird of Denmark, so I found that fitting. Yeah. Awesome. Well, <laughs> I wish we could do a little outro with Milan, but I think he's having some issues. Um, Bach, why don't we go to Captain's? Oh, he's back. Nice. Just made it. Yeah, just made it. Hey, can you just let us know uh, where we can find you and where we can follow you and maybe see any of the stuff that you're working on? Yeah, you can check me out on Facebook. It's fb.me slash Nerf. I will post that in the chat. Awesome. Um, and also on Etsy, um, on the etsy.shop slash devilsnerf, I believe. Sweet. Well, this was super awesome. Thank you guys for joining. Um, it was a great chat. Again, I wish we could chat forever. <laughs> Thank um, you for having us. Yeah. All right, Buff, whenever you want to 